Okay, um, if you'd like to turn to Revelation chapter 8, uh, we'll be looking at the second trumpet um, tonight. But before we get into reading that, um, I just want to sort of do a little recap of the, the, the context of the trumpets. We looked at a bit of this last week. Um, can someone read for us again Revelation 8 verses 2 through to 6? I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blast. The first angel blew his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned. Okay. So in this, this opening scene in verse two and um, verse six there of chapter eight, we're seeing these scenes with these seven angels standing with the seven trumpets. But then in verses three to five, these seven trumps are interrupted by this extra scene with another angel appearing, offering up the prayers of the saints mixed with incense. And this gives us the, the context in which to understand the trumpets in. Now, he's offering up the prayers of the saints. And we, we ask the question, um, where do we see the prayers of the saints appearing in, in Revelation? And we saw that happening back in chapter 6, which we, what we previously looked at under the seven seals. In Revelation, um, yeah, Revelation 6 under the fifth seal, Revelation 6 verses 9 to 10, When he opened the fifth seal, he says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so we have under the fifth seal that the saints offer up this prayer to God, and they are praying for God to, to judge, to avenge them upon those that had persecuted them. So this angel at the beginning of the seven trumpets is offering up the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the saints who are praying for God to judge those who slew them. And in response to these prayers being offered up in chapter eight, what does the angel do? What's the next thing that happens after these prayers are offered up and ascended up before God? Pass the sensor to the ground, does it? Or to the earth? Yes, yes. The sensor is filled up with with fire from the altar and cast it, and we have this judgment being poured out. So the prayers of the saints, right. praying for God to judge those who have sl slain them and martyred them. In response to that, this judgment is poured out upon the earth. And when we see it was cast to the earth and there were voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake, these are the things we see under the seventh trumpet. So this judgment that is poured out is, um, it, it shows the, the culmination of the events happening under the seventh trumpet. So that gives us the idea 
that the context of the, the seven trumpets and the judgments being poured out upon that power that was persecuting and killing God's people. Yes, Gaylene. Is that seventh trumpet or seventh seal? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Is, is that the seventh trumpet or seal? You said that what happens um, in verse 5 happens under the seventh trumpet. Yep. I thought it was the seventh seal. Um, the, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, that they both deal with that that same event that like the second okay. coming under the seventh seal we've seen it there silence in heaven for half an hour um and the reason that's happening is because christ is returning with all the father's angels to um you know in the second coming okay now that's cool sorry but also if we look at the seventh um the seventh trumpet um we see this same imagery happening which is, you know, happening at that second coming. Okay. Mm -hmm. I thought they were different for some reason. And so last week, we looked at um, that the first trumpet, and we saw that was the, the, the judgment that came against uh, specifically Rome, Western, the Western Roman Empire at this time. Um, and, and, and judging it for the part that it played in persecuting God's people. And these first four um, trumpets, before we get onto the three, three woes, are all judgments against Rome. Now, can someone read out Revelation chapter 8, verse uh, 8 and 9? This is the second angel. I'll read that, Matthew. Yep. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing here is a great mountain cast with fire. Okay, it's cast into the sea. That, that's the, the action that happens, and the result is, again, we get this idea of a third popping up. A third of the sea, a third of the creatures, and a third of the ships were all destroyed. And so what is the significance of the judgment falling on a third part of, of these things? Gaylene? That... Um... <clears throat> That it's, I mean, if it were all the earth, well, then everything would be destroyed. That's kind of, if it's a, it's not for the end of time where things will be all destroyed. It's, you know, bits and pieces here and there. Um, but in that, in that case, it's also like a, um, you know, the small local now and a larger global later. Mm. So it, it's that um, illustration type situation mm -hmm. yep these are only, only partial judgments and again it shows like when you compare the trumpets to the plagues a lot of the judgments fall upon the same thing uh, versus upon the, the earth the sea the rivers the sun but in the trumpets everything's a third Showing it's only a partial judgment, that there is still mercy mixed with these judgments. Whereas with the plagues, the judgments that are absolute, that's after the close of probation. But in, in these judgments that God is pouring out, there is still mercy. He is still withholding. The judgments only fall on a third. Um, but now I'm going to look at a few verses uh, in the Old Testament um, at what the, the symbols is of, of this mountain burning with fire being cast into the sea. Can somebody read for me Daniel chapter 2? Daniel 2, verse 34 and 35.
is it 232? Daniel 34 and 35. Then Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. Two, one, two, or three. Sorry. Daniel chapter two. Oh, two. Okay. I'll yeah. read it. Uh, this image head was of fine gold. Is that the one? Chapter uh, verse uh, 34. 34. 35. Thou sawest till a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Mm -hmm. And 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. Mm. So in this, this vision, we see that this, this great mountain um, appearing. And so the question is, what is the interpretation of this mountain? Can somebody read verse 44 and 45? And we want to see what Daniel tells us about what this mountain represents. <coughs> Obviously. And in the days of these kings shall the king of the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out in out of the mountain without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So what did that mountain represent? The enemy. Well, was that oh, so? It's it's kingdom. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to share... Isaiah 51, verse 25, it says, Look, almighty mountain, destroyer of the earth, I am your enemy, says the Lord. I will raise my fist against you and knock you down from the heights. When I am finished, you will be nothing but a heap of burnt rubble. So what verse was that? That was verse 25 of... Chapter 51 of Jeremiah. Yep. I have a footnote here from uh, Revelation 8, verse 9. Jeremiah 51, 25, and that's what it brought me to. Mm -hmm. That's why I said that the mountain is, represents the enemy. Mm, but right? in, in Daniel chapter 2, which we read, yeah. the, the stone comes down and smashes the image on its feet and shatters the image together and then that stone grows into a great mountain and when Daniel's given us the interpretation of what that means he talks about it being the kingdom of God the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed I wonder how they correlate then mm -hmm. Jeremiah 51 25 well, can I get someone to read um, Jeremiah chapter 51 Verse 24 and 25. Well, right here it says, I will repay Babylon and the people of Babylonia for all the wrong they have done to my people in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. Look, almighty mountain, destroyer of the earth, I am your enemy, says the Lord. I will raise my fist against you to knock you down from the height when I'm finished you will be nothing but a heap of rumble. Hmm. So in that place, when he's talking about the destroying mountain, what is he referring to? Who is this destroying mountain? 
that's that's the uh, the enemy, I thought. Huh? Yeah, but but yeah. he he, he, he identifies. A, yeah, thank you, Margaret. The Babylon. He identifies a specific people with it. It's Babylon. So in Daniel two, the mountain was referred to as the kingdom of God. Here, this mountain is referred to the kingdom of Babylon. Okay. And that's the enemy, right? In, in chapter 20, uh, Jeremiah 51, it is. But in Daniel 2, it's, it's God's kingdom. But the, the thing that is consistent between both of them is a mountain is being used to represent a kingdom. So did you say kingdom of Babylon? Yeah, in Jeremiah 51. Because as you see there in verse 24, he's addressing, I will render unto Babylon. Mm. He's speaking about Babylon and he says, I'm against the O destroying mountain, saith the Lord. And then at the end of that verse, he says, I will make thee a burnt mountain. Speaking of his judgment of Babylon again, referring to Babylon will be a burnt mountain mm. after he has judged it. So in both instances here, um, the mountain is being used to represent a kingdom. Uh, Petra. So I guess that could be seen as a parallel to the two women in Revelation. You know, one is representing God's people, one is representing the enemy. Mm. Uh, okay, okay. Yep, I think that's a, that's a good... Uh, a good parallel. Um, now, can we turn to the book of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter uh, 32. And read um, verse 21 and 22. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn into the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Mm. So the question, what is God going to do there? And what is that in response to? Pride in the fire. It's, uh, cleansing. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a judgment for, for idolatry. Hmm because they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. Yep. It sounds... Um, in some ways, it sounds literal, but yet in some ways not. And with regards to the mountain, because to set on fire the foundations of mountains, that sounds like magma chambers inside volcanoes. Mm -hmm. So that part of it sounds literal, um, but I don't know if the rest would be. In verse 22, obviously 21 is, you know, um, they have provoked God to, um, to, um, to a judgment. So that's obviously, you know, judgment is literal. But what the judgment or what the punishment is hmm. i'm unsure it sounds little but yet it doesn't mm -hmm. yep yep there, there are actually often in, in, in passages 
um, it jumps between literal and symbolic. Um, and sometimes it's hard to draw the line of exactly what's meant as literal and what is symbolic. But sometimes the entire passage is literal where it's entirely symbolic. Other times it jumps between. Uh, we'll look at a, a verse in a little bit that, that does that, um, just to illustrate the point. But um, I, I think you, you rightly picked up here that this is in God is speaking this in response to their idolatry, their worship of false gods. And in response to their worship of false gods, he speaks about having a mountain set on fire or the foundations of a mountains on fire. Um, and that's something that, you know, in my mind linked me to um, what we read about in that second trumpet a mountain being on fire was cast into the sea. So I just typed in the word, you know, mountain and, and fire and searched. Um, and I found this one where the foundation of the mountains being put on fire was part of God's response to judge a people for their idolatry and their worship of false gods. Um, also, also uh, Matthew, doesn't it say at the end time that the people are filled with shame that are not following the Lord and they'll invite the fireballs to fall on them because of their shame. They'll want to die, actually. I, I have a recollection. I think that's talking about that final lake of fire. Is, is that what you're referring to? In that final... Yeah. Yeah, I think After that. Every, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that, yeah. Yeah, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every, they all realize, um, you know, sort of that, that God was righteous, that they were wrong. Right. And sort of the, you could say the guilt and shame on that. They, right. they acknowledge their judgment as being just. Mm -hmm. So he's preparing them for this now? Hmm. Well, as we see that, that that's sort of the final judgment. Um, as we looked at the trumpets, they're just these, these partial judgments that are poured out throughout history. Mm -hmm. uh, Gaylene. It almost, to me, parallels with the flood. Um, probably not quite so much with the trumpets, but more the end one. Um, that being, um, like Margaretha said the other day, where the earth itself and what's underneath are God's weapons of mass destruction, I suppose you might say, for his judgment. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing that happened with the flood, though one was water and one is fire. So the same thing is happening. It's just different elements that he is using, but it's still stored up within the earth that he will be using. Hmm. Uh, Margarita. I might have missed something you said, but if mountains represent kingdoms, then is God saying he'll set on fire the foundations of the kingdoms? Hmm. Um. I, and this is sort of getting to Gaylene's question, where she said, you know, what part of it jumps from, from literal to symbolic? Um, you know, sometimes mountains refer to symbolically as a kingdom, as we saw in Daniel and Jeremiah. Other times, I'm talking about setting on, on fire the mountains, like when um, he spoke the Ten Commandments, that mountain was set on fire. Okay, that's just referring to the literal... Um, the, the literal thing that happened, you know, when he descended the, on that mountain. The foundations doesn't seem mm. um, like literal, the mountains, you know. Yeah. Um, it more, to me, it sounds more like foundations of kingdoms destroy the kingdom, destroy mm. its foundations, and it's finished. Yes, yep, yep, that, that could be. It fits as well. Can we turn to Psalms? 
Psalms 83 and verse 13 through to 16. What verse? Psalms 83, verse 13 to 16. Okay. Oh my God, make them like a wheel as a stubble before the wind. Yep, can you read down to verse 16? As the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with my tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. Any further? Um, yeah, you can read verse 16 as well, but that's, that's pretty much the same. The, uh, the question there is, when it talks about as a flame set up the mountain on fire. So during this talk, and he, he mentions this mountain being set on fire. So in uh, Deuteronomy, we had the foundations of the mountain on fire. Um, here it's just speaking about it, as a mountain is set on fire. Um, and what is that being paralleled with? Fire burns a wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what else in that passage? These are all sort of parallel analogies he's using to say, as the fire burns the wood, as the flames at the mountain on fire, God, I want you to do something. Uh, Petra. Mm. So the wheel that's mentioned in 13, is that an indication to stimulate a response or an activity which would fit with verse 16, fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord? Amen. Oh, mm -hmm. They were disgraced. Mm -hmm. So what? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So you're right there. The sort of the the bookends of that part we read out. The the enders, you know, um, in verse 16, as you mentioned, oh. fill their face with shame that they might seek thy name. So it's talking about these people that have rebelled against God. The the enemies make a turmoil up in verse two. You know, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Okay, God's enemies have, have risen up and he's asking judgment upon them. But it's interesting in verse 16, as you said, it's that they might seek thy name. And verse 18 goes with that too. Mm. That men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high of all the earth. Mm. So it's aiming to bring them to repentance. Okay, this judgment being poured out upon them to bring them to repentance. But the question we want to know for, for our um, study on the trumpets, when we see the, the mountain on fire cast into the sea, in this psalm, it says, you know, to God, as the flame setteth the mountain on fire. Okay, it's using this as a as a analogy. What does he want God to do? He wants, he wants God to persecute him, them with his tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. Mm. So he wants a judgment to be given. Mm -hmm. He wants something done. Absolutely. As it, as it were. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, having the mountains set on fire is a parallel or... This, what he's using, this poetic parallel 
to saying that's how he wants God to judge these people, to judge his enemies. Um, so the symbol of a mountain in Daniel and Jeremiah representing a kingdom. Um, but in there, we looked in, in Deuteronomy and Psalms, the mountain being set on fire is God's judgment against these kingdoms. Okay, God, God's judgment against idolatry, specifically the worship of false gods in Deuteronomy. And here in Psalms, God's judgments against the enemies um, that are fighting against his people. Now, before we jump back, um, can we look at Psalms 80? Um, and read verse 8 to 11. And, and this goes into what you said, Gaylene, when there's a mixture of literal and symbolic. Okay, I just want, as we read through this, just notice how it mixes the literal and symbolic together. Want eight to eleven of chapter eighty? Yes. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparedest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the bows thereof were like feathers. She sent out her bows unto the sea and her branches unto the river. Mm. So if I was to ask the question, is that passage symbolic or literal? How would you answer that? Petra. You know that God brought his people out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So it's speaking of the, the Exodus, leaving Egypt and then being established in the land of Canaan. But is that passage literal or symbolic? Both. Yeah. A born out of Egypt. Mm. Of is symbolic mm. out of Egypt. Yep, absolutely. And and so it's using vine to symbolically represent God's people, but Egypt is literally the place where he brought them out. And so throughout this whole um, section there, it's constantly swapping between literal and symbolic. Um without actually giving us an indication of, of when it's doing it, you've just got to read it and um, understand what parts of the, the symbols being used and what parts of the literal um, events or people or places indicated. Um, so that's just to, to, to answer Gaylene's question um, about that other uh, passage we looked at where it looks like some of it could have been literal and some symbolic. And it's just to show that the Bible actually does this quite often. Um, well, in, in several places anyway. Uh, this, is, this is one of the examples. In uh, Jeremiah 2, verse uh, 21, it says, but I was the one who planted you choosing a vine of the purest stock, the very best. How did you grow into this corrupt wild vine? Mm. No amount of soap or lye can make you clean. I still see the stain of your guilt. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Oh, this is all, to me, a cleansing. It's been fire is purified. And uh, he's allowing 
praise to be administered. He's allowing them to submit to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's one of the things that comes up there in that Psalms eighty three, when you know the mountain set on fire was with, with with God, you know, persecuting with a tempest these the enemies of his people that it had attacked them. The purpose of that judgment was for them to repent. Amen. So that when the judgment was poured upon them, they would, you know, the shame would cover their faces and they would turn and seek the Lord. Mm. So if we, if we jump back to Revelation 8, verse 8 and 9, when we see this, this great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. So what, what I look at here, when we're going to look for the fulfillment of this, we've got a couple of things to go by. First of all, what we covered with the beginning, looking at the angel offering up the prayers of the saints, we know the trumpets are in the context of God's judgment against those, that power, those nations who were persecuting his people. Okay, and we know that was the Rome when, when we looked through the, the seals. A lot of that persecution had come from Rome. So looking at the judgments upon Rome, and here with a mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. Okay, a, a mountain is, is this nations going to come, and a mountain burning with fire is again a judgment against idolatry, against the, those worshipping false gods. Um, and now when we jump into to history, we, uh, uh, a significant uh, nation actually arises that fits a lot of these criteria. And we're going to look at into the sea and, and the third part of these, um, the fish and the ships as well, as we go through identifying this, this power. We saw that the first trumpet was Ulrich. Um, king of the Visigoths and his empire that came down and fulfilled that. Next, we have, um, not long after him, there was the kingdom of the Vandals uh, crossed the Rhine in 406. I'm going to share something here. I found a little... A little uh, map here. Now, the, just the, the red there is what Ulrich of the Visigoths did. He came through here through um, Elastrium, went in there, sacked Rome in 410 AD, and settled out here in Gaul. Um, and just interestingly to note, when it talked about that first um, judgment being on a third part that was judged, if you take the Roman Empire as it was, um, in both Western and Eastern, roughly how much did the Visigoths go through in their, their invasion and destroy? When I look at that, that looks to me like roughly a third. These red lines went in through here, throughout Greece, Macedonia, up through Italy, and into Gaul or Southern France, Spain. It's roughly a third of the nation that was judged. The, the Vandals, there's this purple line. They came down through France, Spain. Um, they, they crossed with a couple of other tribes. This blue one here, the um, Suvi, that stayed in what, is, what became Portugal. But they ended up crossing the Gibraltar Straits in uh, 439 and took Carthage. And then all of North Africa became the Vandals. And so again, it's interesting that the, the path they took when they invaded um, actually affected about a third of the Roman Empire. Um, but there's some other interesting things that happened with the Vandals. They had the, the desert to the south, which meant they, they couldn't 
do anything further this way. So what they did from Carthage is they actually built and invested a lot into building a navy. And they controlled the entire Mediterranean um, with their ships launching attacks up against the coast of Rome. Um, their king, uh, Genseric, the king of the Visigoths, um, as we saw with Ulrich, king of the, uh, sorry, king of the Ulrich, king of the Visigoths, and Gernesuric, king of the Vandals, they both had this this idea that they were being led by God to be His tool of judgment. You now we saw la last week, um, Ulrich didn't want to attack Rome, but he said that he kept feeling this hand pushing him forward. To, to go and, and attack this. Um, Genseric, king of the Vandals, it was uh, known for, in one of the, the raiding parties, that the ships pulled anchor and they set up from Carthage to go and attack somewhere along the Mediterranean coast. And this is, is a quote from a, a historian. He says that, re recalling this event, he says, the helmsman turned to the king and asked for what port he should seek. For the men with whom God is angry, answered the Vandal king, and left the winds and the waters to settle the question to where the proper object of the wrath of heaven. So again, it's he had the, the, the these kingdoms were brought there with the idea that they were brought there by God to judge Rome, to execute God's judgment upon the Roman Empire. And they didn't decide to go and attack certain cities. They, they sailed out into the Mediterranean and let the winds and the wave decide where they would go to what port they would attack. Um, letting God decide was, was their me mentality. Um, and in 455, they sailed up the, um, the river in Italy and ended up sacking Rome. Rome was um, you know, first sacked in 410 by the Visigoths. Now this time the Vandals made it to the gates of Rome and sacked it again. Um, this time when the Vandals were approaching the city, it was actually Pope Leo the first that uh, made an agreement with them that as long as they didn't destroy the city or murder the inhabitants, the city would surrender. And Rome opened its gates and the Vandals went in and sp spent um, 15, no, sorry, 14 days sacking the city. And one thing of interest, um, although it's a little bit debated by historians, but it seems to be some, some good evidence that during this sack of Rome, the Vandals actually took the um, table of showbread and the, and the menorah from Rome that Titus had taken from Jerusalem when he destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Um, so they, they took that from Rome to sail back to Carthage. Um, now there is some no one knows what happened to it after then. Um, there's some sources that say there was a storm that hit them on the way back and the boat that was carrying that stuff ended up sinking. Um, but we don't know. But that's an interesting point. However, following the sacking of Rome um, and the vandal sort of naval superiority over the Mediterranean, uh, the general Majorian became the emperor of Western Rome uh, two years later in 557 AD and he built a large navy to go and attack the Vandals and to try to destroy them and reclaim the Mediterranean. 
and this was in Force uh, 61, the Battle of Car Cartagena. Cartagena. Um, and at this battle, the Vandals completely wiped out the Roman Navy, completely destroyed the, the, the ships of Rome that they had sent to get them. Then uh, a few years later, in 468, Rome had managed to build a second Navy fleet. This time, it was a coalition between the Eastern Empire and the Western Emperor. And so the United Roman Empire's Navy sailed to Carthage um, to land troops at Cape Bourne to um, destroy them. But uh, in 468, the Vandals set fire to a large portion of their fleet, killing over, I mean, again, historians, or I should say there's different historical sources for how large the fleets were and how many soldiers were destroyed. But um, they, they seem to be a, a safe number, saying about 10,000 uh, Romans were killed during that battle and their fleet was absolutely decimated. So we have there this, this judgment of the Vandals upon the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. They took North Africa off the, the, the Western Roman Empire. Their invasion covered about a third of the empire. Their dominance over the Mediterranean Sea, and it was through the Mediterranean Sea and the Navy that they sacked Rome, that they destroyed the Roman navies twice, um, destroyed the Roman navies. And their uh, dominance over the, the Mediterranean Sea lasted until Emperor Justinian in 533 sent his armies to Africa and uh, routed the Vandals and completely wiped them out. Um, it's estimated that around 5 million were, were killed in North Africa under Emperor Justinian. He um, evidently didn't take Vandal prisoners and completely wiped the nation out. Yes, Galing. So wiping and wiping them out, that would be one of the three horns that were plucked up at the root because they don't exist anymore. Yes, yes, so, that's right. Um, These vandals. What one of the like, reasons why they were such a scourge on the empire, um, if you could use that word, was because they were Aryan. Uh, that was um, my exact what I was going to say. Weren't they Aryan? Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank a lot of these Germanic tribes were Aryan. Um, many of them converted to Catholicism, um, but there were a number that remained Aryan. Um, and in their attacks on, on Rome, um, eventually Justinian came and completely wiped them out. The Vandals didn't disappear because they were absorbed into another nation or or forced into conversion. They disappeared because Justinian killed 5 million people throughout North Africa. So if we go back to read Revelation 8, verse 8 and 9, Thinking of the history of these, um, the Vandals and the King uh, Gennesaret. So we see the second angel sounded and there was a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. And so you see a, a great nation, um, this mountain burning with fire is a judgment against 
idolatry, the false worship, the enemies of God. And it was cast into the sea. Now, sea is sometimes interpreted as peoples, nations, multitude, and, and languages, um, as we see elsewhere, like in Revelation 17. Or we can understand it here as that being where it switches to literal. The great mountain burning with fire being symbolic for the vandal, the nation of vandals, judging the idolatrous or the, the idolatry and the false worship of papal Rome. And it being cast into the sea, being this, this Mediterranean, which is where it wreaked havoc with its navy on the empire. And that's where we see a third part of the sea became blood. A third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. The, the havoc the vandals wreaked were on the Mediterranean Sea, destroying the ships of Rome twice. And so we see in, in all those aspects, that second trumpet, well, the first trumpet was fulfilled by the Visigoths, and the second one is fulfilled by the vandals. And these first two judgments upon Rome that led to the fall of the Roman Empire. 